Good morning, everyone. We are going to get started in just a moment. Just going to let Zoom uh, let everybody into the webinar. To see everybody starting to join. We've got a great crowd for today's webinar, so that's wonderful to see. Just give it a couple more seconds here. Okay. Oh, we still have quite a few people joining, so I'll just give it about five more seconds. Okay, let's get started. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us for today's webinar. My name is Stephanie Crowley, and I'm the Editorial Director overseeing Potatoes in Canada magazine. I will be your host for today's webinar, which is presented in collaboration with the Ontario Potato Board. I am joined today by Jeff Miller of Miller Research, a private agricultural research company based in Rupert, Idaho. Jeff is a plant pathologist with a special emphasis on potato crops. And today during our free 60 minute session, Jeff will share information on how to identify common foliar diseases of potatoes. Before we begin, I'd like to thank Syngenta for sponsoring today's webinar. Level up your potato protection with Miravis Duo fung fungicide from Syngenta. Miravis Duo raises the bar for foliar potato fungicides. It delivers effective early blight control and broad spectrum disease protection so growers can proactively tackle several devastating diseases at once. This season, trust Miravis Duo to protect yield and quality in your potatoes. Learn more at syngenta.ca. Always read and follow label directions. Just again, before we get started, I'd like to remind everyone that this webinar is being recorded and will be made available to all registered attendees and participants approximately 24 hours after our live broadcast. This session is scheduled to run for approximately 60 minutes. Jeff will speak for about 45 minutes. We'll have about a 15 minute Q&A period to follow, but we might also answer some questions throughout the presentation, so keep watching for that. If you do have any questions throughout the presentation, please type them into the Q&A box on the bottom of your Zoom webinar screen. I will be posing them to Jeff verbally and he'll be able to answer where it fits. This webinar has also been approved for one CCA CEU in integrated pest management. Further instructions for receiving your CCA credit for today's session will follow the webinar. So without further ado, I will turn it over to Jeff to take it away. Thanks so much, Stephanie. I'm glad to have the chance to visit with all of you today, even if it's virtually. And I want to thank Eugenia Banks. She really is the one, the, I guess, the, the brain behind all of this and has provided the majority of the photographs. But it's been a pleasure to work with her and put together this presentation. We're going to focus on uh, providing um, tools, I guess, to help you diagnose potato diseases, problems you might see in the field. We're not really talking about management today, but more about diagnosis. And if we were to include magic in there, this could be a several hour presentation. And I know for a fact, nobody wants to listen to me talk for that long. I just start by, start by talking about what a disease is. Really, um, we, we think we know what it is. Uh, and sometimes we get confused and we may talk about the pathogen and the diseases that the same thing, but there is a, somewhat of a difference. A disease is actually a malfunctioning of cells or tissues. And it can result from a pathogen. And in this example, I have a, a PDY, which is caused by a virus, and this photo is from Jonathan Whitworth. It can also occur from environmental factors. Here's an example of sun skull, which is discolored these leaves. Now, this presentation, we're going to focus more on uh, pathogenic agents. We will talk about some environmental factors as they can look like pathogenic agents. But the main point is you have some kind of agent, whether it be a pathogen or an environmental stressor that leads to development of some type of symptoms. And diseases they occur, occur quite naturally. Sometimes uh, in social media, we hear things about uh, it wouldn't be nice if we could grow crops in, in a natural setting. But it's important to remember that diseases are quite natural themselves. For disease to occur, you have to have really three things to happen. You have to have a host, which in this case is the potato. Then you have to have a favorable environment or conditions that allow a pathogen, which in this case, Verticillium dallii, to infect the potato. And the resulting disease is Verticillium wilt. And if you're able to take away one of those legs of the triangle, then disease just doesn't occur. We, I won't spend a lot of time talking about environmental conditions, but there are some, some generalizations that we can make. Um, there are certain diseases that tend to appear more often when we have wet, humid weather. And these are things like black leg or dakia, um, rhizoctonia, late blight, gray mold, white mold, and aerial stem rot. And there are some other foliar diseases which tend to occur more when we have warm and dry conditions like verticillium wilt, 
a brown spot, black dot, and a fusarium wilt. And there are others like early blight, which will develop really regardless of what the weather conditions are like. So I'm gonna start off by talking about some diseases that cause poor emergence. So why some of these diseases that are on this slide aren't necessarily foliar diseases, uh, may, maybe more tuber diseases, they can result in, in uh, foliar symptoms. And that's why we've chosen to focus on these to begin. And so we'll talk about uh, fusarium dry rot, bacterial soft rot, black leg, the Kia late blight, and then rhizoctonia. We'll start off with fusarium dry rot or seed piece decay. And if you have tubers on the, exter on the external symptoms that look like they have these wrinkled, um, maybe a dark brown, sometimes they can even uh, approach a black color, they may be split. When you cut them open, you'll see there's fungal growth inside of these cavities. And it is a dry, crumbly rot. Sometimes you can, you can flick the, the decay part away with your fingers. And as that rot increases or the decay increases in the seed, the plant that will grow from that may be stunted. And in some cases, it may not even emerge. Now, if the, if the decay isn't too bad, you can have a normal sized plant. But oftentimes what happens is you get a weakened plant that may die before it reaches maturity. Blackleg is a bacterium uh, caused by a bacterium uh, named Petrobac Pectobacterium atraseptica. And um, I like the way you, Eugenia has talked about this is the old versus the new blackleg. And the newer would be the Kia dianthicola. And we're going to talk about the differences between these because um, it does go a little bit to management, or at least what you might expect to um, how severe the disease might be in your field. With black leg, the infection starts from the seed piece and it moves up the stem, which is shown in this picture right here. Now, these bacteria, they really don't survive very well in the soil. They're often introduced on the seed pieces and they thrive in wet conditions. So if you're in a place where you have like a low area or you know that the soil stays wet for a long period of time, then that's a good uh, indication that that might be a place where black leg might occur. I don't really have any seed treatments that can manage this, um, at least some that are effective. And um, the tuber infections between the old black leg and the new black leg we've talked about, they can be quite similar, but the stem infection is a little bit different. And that's what we'll focus on today. So the old black leg or pectobacterium is really favored by temperatures which are in that 10 to 24 degrees centigrade range. So it really is more of a cool weather black leg versus the new one, Dakia. It's, uh, it's really active when you get above 25 C and optimum around 27 degrees centigrade. So as a result of that, you think about the temperatures your plants are going to face during the growing season, you'd expect to see pectobacterium occur really around the time of emergence and early in the season. Whereas the key would show up usually later um, as, as the temperatures start to warm up, maybe we're getting into June or July. The rot does initiate from the, the seed piece. And as you look at the stem with the old black leg or pectobacterium, you'll get this inky black, it's, it's slimy, there's a, an odor to it, it's kind of smelly, and the pith is it's mushy. And the stems really rot from the outside to the inside. They'll desiccate and you'll get a shriveled uh, stem, the plant will be quite small. With the kia, the stems actually can be a green to a brown. The odor is not quite the same, the pith is more macerated, and it rots actually from the inside out. So you'll get these hollow stems that are desiccated. Now, there are always going to be some um, exceptions to the rules, and there may be some um, cases where you get some intergradations between the two, but this is a good generalization between this, this older and this new um, black leg that we see. So here's a picture of the, the old uh, black leg pectobacterium. You have an infected plant, it's stunted. Um, the leaves are somewhat stiff and erect, and you get the yellowing and they'll start to roll and eventually that plant will die. This picture shows more of a, that slimy black appearance, again, starting below ground and working its way up. And it will be early in the season because it's favored by cooler temperatures. Now, mid to late season, if you do have some that, do, that survive, you'll see these plants that, that, that look quite smaller. You get this curling of the leaves, and we're going to show you some of the diseases today that will do the same thing. But if you look down inside the canopy, you'll see this blackened tissue, and it will have started from below the set step, below the soil line, and working its way up. So when it comes to scouting, if you want to go out and see, do I have black leg in the field? You want to look in low wet spots or anywhere where the soil might be wet for a longer period of time. But in reality, it can be anywhere. So as you walk across the field, it's good to see: do you have any plants that show those rolling leaves, or may look stunted? and it will show up earlier. And so uh, let's compare that now to the new black leg or the 
the kia. In this case, uh, the stems, they may be brown or green above ground, but when you cut it open, you'll see that there is this decay that has started from the inside and it's actually worked its way out. And then we'll have the same order that we typically see with that, that older type of blackleg. Here's a picture of the Dakia blackleg and the foliar symptoms aren't quite as severe in this, at least in this photograph, as to what we see in the pectobacterium. But I will say that the, the Dakia is much more aggressive than the pectobacterium is. This is a, an example of showing some seed that's starting to decay. And here's the stems have been split open and you see the decay is starting from the inside and it will eventually work its way out, which is somewhat different than what we see with the pectobacterium. These older plants now, um, the upper leaves look uh, somewhat nice and healthy, but the lower leaves are trying to wilt. Um, and it's really, you really can't see necessarily the seed, the infected seed storage, because the, the development of this pathogen is favored by warmer temperatures. So if you're holding your seed in a low storage, or as the plants are first growing and the temperatures are cool, you may not see this. So as the soil warms up, you're going to see these infections in the field. Once they start, they can be quite devastating because it is a little more aggressive. So at high temperatures, you know, around 27 degrees centigrade is optimal. You get rapid development, the plants turn yellow and die, and it is much more aggressive than the pectobacterium. So really it takes less inoculum to kill a plant with, with the dakia compared to the pectobacterium. If you're, if you're scouting for dakia, it's, it's very similar to what you do with pectobacterium. It can be anywhere in the field, but especially in the wet low, low spots. If you have areas where uh, water ponds, maybe be a pivot track or a sprayer track, that would be a good place to look. And again, it's gonna develop later in, this, in the, this late spring or early summer due to the higher temperatures. And so in this case, if you see uh, wilted plants, you cut it open to see, is am I having this hollowing out or this rotting that's inside the stem? And it would have a different odor. Here's a comparison of the two side by side. I showed this photo earlier with the, the old pectobacterium blackleg versus the new dakia. Um, doesn't quite look the same. The stems are a little bit greener. And so really to know for certain the difference, you have to have a PCR test to confirm this. And um, so you know, the dakia has been a, a big problem in, in, with some seed lots in some areas lately. Um, and so if you suspect you have it, it's good to get it to a diagnostic lab that can identify that for certain. So now we're going to shift gears and move on to Rhizoctonia stem and stolen canker. Now I realize this is not necessarily a foliar disease, but the, the canker does have an effect on the foliage, and we'll talk about that. This disease is caused by the fungus Rhizoctonia solani. And there's actually different strains of the fungus, um, for lack of a better word, we call them anastomosis groups or AGs. And some of these are actually um, adapted to different crop species. So like, for instance, if I'm growing beans, I might be worried about anastomosis group four or AG4. But with potatoes, primarily it's AG3. The other, now, other AGs can cause symptoms on potatoes. It can be different, but AG3 is the predominant one. It is uh, present in the seed. It's also present on the soil. And it can reduce emergence when the, the pathogen concentrations are quite high. You can have a reduction stand um, due to brown cankers that will develop on those, on those um, emerging stems. Now, it does not infect or does not rot the tubers. So this is something that just grows superficially in the tubers. This is an example of the black scurf. You may have all seen this. It's very common to find it in grocery stores and you're buying potatoes for consumption. It looks like dirt that just doesn't wash off. And this is actually the, the mycelia or the fungal, the fungus growing in its hard mat we call these sclerotia. They're irregular shaped and they will germinate. So as this sprout begins to grow, the, the the rhizoctonia fungus will grow right onto the sprout. So as the sprout grows up, you get these lesions that are on the stem. When they're very, very severe, it can actually cut off that stem. And so you'll have uh, maybe multiple stems that come up. So when you have severe rhizoctonia, oftentimes we see an increase in your stem number. It can also infect the stolons and, and young tubers like this. And when it's very severe, uh, plant, weakened plants can even be killed. So if you have severe rhizoctonia, there are above ground symptoms you look for. And one of those are aerial tubers. So because you have these stem cankers, the photosynthate or the starch that's being produced in the leaves can't be moved in the phloem down into the tubers. So because it's cut off, you have the production of these tubers. You, you might see them at the ground level. Sometimes they'll be up at the leaf axles. And that's, you, this is not doing you any good as a potato farmer. You want to get that down below ground. 
In addition, you'll get these rolling of the top leaves and they may be discolored a little bit. And there are many other things that might cause similar symptoms like zebra chip, uh, particular leaf roll virus can look similar and there are physiological problems. Another symptom, above ground symptom of rhizoctonium is this white growth. Um, and this is actually the sexual stage of the fungus and they call it Thanatephorus cucumeris. It is, uh, it really only grows at the base of the, state, uh, base of the stem and you may see it later in the season. The stems will remain green and, and you can actually just take your finger and, and wipe that off. And it doesn't, um, you know, it doesn't appear to cause really any damage to the stem. And so, but sometimes people will see this and they'll think, oh, I've got white mold or something else developing in the field. But this is actually just a sexual stage and as far as we know, it, it, uh, it doesn't necessarily cause damage to the plant. And not actually, you have data, so it's, it's not really that well correlated to how severe the rise of Tony may be below ground, but it is a foliar symptom that you might see. So when it comes to um, scouting for rhizoctonia, the problem here, okay. It can occur anywhere in the field, and especially if you think of this coming in on the seed, um, but so you have to just look through the field to see anywhere you might have a stunted or a weak plant. And if you find one, you pull it up and you look for those cankers, those brown cankers that are on the lower stems. And if you see something like this, then you know you're dealing with rhizoctonia. We'll shift gears now and talk about late blight. And this may be one of, it is the most uh, important foliar disease of potatoes, primarily because it has the potential to be so destructive. I would say that in recent years, it really hasn't been as, uh, as damaging as it was in the past. And there's many reasons for that, but I think one of them has been our ability to scout. And by scouting, import, we were able to implement some really good control measures in a timely manner. Now, late blight or the pathogen Phytophthora festans, it will infect um, several solanaceous crops. So not just potatoes, but also tomatoes, bell peppers, eggplants, petunias, and nightshade. And in fact, in the past, we've had significant outbreaks that have been linked with tomatoes and the movement of say garden tomatoes. So it, it requires basically every control strategy that we have. And scouting is essential. This is a picture that Eugenia provided where there were six rows over here in this field that weren't getting sprayed and that you really wanted to sprout scouting. So the disease started and actually almost completely destroyed all these plants where you can see those over here on this side looked quite healthy where they were being treated. This is a picture of late blight that appears to have started from a seed piece, probably somewhere here in the middle. And as the disease started, it began to spread out in this, this radiating fashion to get these, these large um, holes or these disease foci. And under very favorable conditions, meaning that it's, it's cool and humid or wet, um, the pathogen can spread very quickly. In fact, it can go through its life cycle in about uh, three to four days for the most optimal conditions. And so that's what we call a community disease because it produces all these spores that can spread fast. And we'll show those in just a minute. One comment about late blight is, uh, you know, mentioned it thrives in wet weather. And so um, irrigation can create conditions that will favor um, the development of disease. Now it's, you know, irrigation actually doesn't replicate what you see in a thunderstorm. And uh, we've seen that here in the, the semi-arid conditions where I work in the Pacific Northwest United States, where we can have late blight in a field that's being irrigated. Um, and, and we notice that if we irrigate in, in conditions, like say where it, it, um, we're focusing more at night, when we're extending those wet periods, it can make the disease worse, but thunderstorms are much, much more effective at, at spreading the pathogen around and causing the disease to take off. So as far as late blight goes, you wanna start scouting crop emergence. And you look for um, lesions that have a light green halo on the underside of the leaf, there might be some um, uh, white growth and we'll show examples of that. And it can also get on the stems. And there's some very characteristic symptoms uh, of stem lesions about late blight that we can show. And um, there are some alert systems that are available. There are many forecasting systems out there that use weather data, but all these are really trying to do is tell you what is the favorability of the environment. Okay, so that's, you can use as one tool, but remember that's just one leg of the disease triangle. You can also use spore traps. And we have a picture here of spore traps and Eugenia has done a lot of work with this, showing that as spores are blown in the wind, they're captured inside this uh, trap. There's a, there's a little cartridge in there. 
where a lab can look and see, um, have we have we captured any spores blowing in the wind? So you, 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 the host that you have, the, the potatoes crop, all the potatoes that we grow are susceptible to disease. So you know you have a susceptible host. If the environment is favorable, using the spore traps can tell you if that third leg of the triangle, the pathogen is present. Now, when it comes to scouting, you always want to check high-risk areas. And those would be low spots in the field, areas that might dry out slower. Um, anywhere near the pivot center point, when you think about the, the geometry of the pivot and how long that uh, plants get irrigated, that they're exposed to water for a lot longer period of time, closer to the pivot, the farther out. Um, pivot and sprayer tracks can also be uh, areas where you might see late white show up first. Weedy areas can be a problem sometimes in those places. The fungicide application or the weeds can shield the plants from getting uh, a proper fungicide dose and late white may show up there. Anywhere that's compacted will dry out slower. And then border areas close to the tree lines. We see oftentimes areas that are in the shadow, like say a, 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 an area that's in the shade, say up till noon, may have more severe late white than areas that are not. Now, tuber symptoms are important to know. Um, you have a, a, a brown to a purplish color on the outside. They're quite variable in size and how they, they may look. Um, you know, bacterial soft drop can look like this, but once you grab the tuber, you'll know if it's soft drop versus late blight. Late blight is a dry, granular, tan to brown rot. It tends to be localized on the outside. You can get it uh, penetrating the inside, but it's, it's very different than what you might see with fusarium dry rot or some of these other diseases. And when you're cutting seeds, so you have infected tubers, um, those that are really infected are likely not going to produce a plant in the field. More than likely than not, the seed's going to decay. But during the seed cutting operation, you can get sporulation. That's what you see this white growth here. And these spores can actually transfer to healthy seed. And then so that that healthy seed piece goes in the ground, the late bite starts to infect. And then when that seed puts up a plant, you get the infection there, which you see here. I'm going to show you some more foliar symptoms in just a second. This is a picture of Manny Robinson showing late blight under cool, wet conditions. You have these black um, water-soaked spots, and, and this can melt down the canopy quite quickly. This is the upper side of a, of a leaf under dry weather. You see this brown to, to black discoloration. In this case, it hit right at the base of the leaflet, and it grew down um, the leaflet blade. This is very common with late blight. And you know that I want to point out or highlight this light green to yellow margin that's around the lesion. This is also very uh, symptomatic of late blight. Under wet weather, if you, if you turn the leaf upside down, you'll see this white growth around the edge. And if we could zoom in, and if you had eyes that we could look at it like a microscope, you'd see the spores there. And we'll show some examples of that. And you may not see this white in under dry conditions, but as soon as the, it gets wet again or humid, this will show up. So we have these active lesions on the up on the top side. Again, there's that brown center with the light green halo or light green to yellow halo on the outside. On the underside, there's all that mycelium. When it dries up, you'll see this margin most of the time. And this is dormant, but as soon this is actually where the pathogen is alive and living. And over here, it's it's dead. It's killed the leaf, and there really isn't much there. One characteristic symptom of late blight is it will infect and grow down the vein. And you won't see that with early blight or brown spot or some of the diseases. Sometimes it, when it hits one of the main veins, it will stop. And so the lesions will look a little more angular in nature. I and mean, eventually they will cross the vein, but early on they don't. Whereas late blight, it does. And it grows right down that leaf vein. And you can get millions of spores per plant. Um, I, we did work showing that if you could take a square centimeter of an infected a sporulating leaf, there's roughly 100,000 spores that get produced there. And they'll be dispersed in the field by rain, wind, it can be machinery, people even walking through the field. I've already talked about how effective thunderstorms can be. And that's why you get this huge spread of the pathogen. And if the conditions are right, you'll get a lot of disease development. Another characteristic thing about late blight is you get these stem lesions, and they will oftentimes encompass the entire stem. They'll grow out on a petiole. And oftentimes they'll make it brittle and it will break. Um, they're dark brown to black. You may not see mycelium on them, you can. But one thing about the stem lesions is the pathogen can survive there for a really long time. So sometimes the leaves, when they get infected, 
after a period of time, they'll die and fall off, but the stem lesions will last through extended periods of, of hot, dry weather. And then when it becomes favorable again, they can spoilate. Here's an example of some stem lesions that do have the spoilation. It's this white growth on here. And they get brittle. They tend to break pretty easy. That's another symptom of late blight. Another one is you get these, these uh, hits at the apex of the plant or the growing point where you have water accumulation. I don't, I'm not sure I know of any of the disease that will do this. And so if you see plants that at the very top of the growing point, they have this black and they're bent over, that is likely going to be late flight, which is causing that to happen. We can also, this is a field that was sprayed with sulfuric acid. So you could also have spoilation of these plants as they start to die from a vine kill. And this is from Dennis Johnson at Columbia Basin. And this is one reason why when they have a severe late blight infestation or disease development, they'll recommend that you put in a fungicide with your vine kill because even though the they say the sulfuric acid in this case is killing the plant um, they want to prevent that spoilation from uh, the spores from falling on the ground and affecting tubers we've talked about the spores if you, you really can't see these with the naked eye but if you could take um, that white growth and put it underneath the microscope you'd see uh, a lot of these uh, thread-like strands with the mycelium then they produce these sporangia they look like a, a little football or, or maybe more like a lemon and when um, under cool temperatures, they'll, they'll form like uh, eight, to ten, eight to 12 little swing spores that can come out. So you see these little circular spores here and they'll swim around and, and they can, on the on leasers, they can, they can zoom and, 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 and basically drive themselves where they wanna be. So sometimes you'll see a leaf like this where you have multiple infection sites. And likely what happened is you had some spores land, they release those zoospores and you're able to go out and initiate multiple infections. I want to make a note about uh, scouting. This picture I'm showing here uh, is a field that, uh, you know, there's a, there's a line here where we park the pickup. You go down right here in the middle. Obviously, this looks much better than over here. This is late blight, um, which is causing the damage. This entire field was treated with all the same fungicides, all the same rates. But what happened is they were spraying on this side, on, on your, the right side of your screen. And I don't really remember the reason why, but they got shut down when they got to this point and didn't seem to be too worried about it. They thought they'd get out the next day. Um, well, a thunderstorm rolled through and uh, it dumped a lot of water. They actually weren't able to get in for a couple of days. When they did, they came back and started here and went this way, kept spraying. So both of these sites got the same fungicides. The difference was the timing in relation to a thunderstorm. So again, I want to say this highlights the importance of why, why we have to scout find the disease when it first shows up, and then take appropriate action. Um, in this case, you know, fungicides are a critical way to manage late blight. They need to be done before um, we have um, weather events rather than after. We really can't, you're trying to manage late blight from a curative point of view after you get started is, is not a good approach. It needs to be preventative in nature. When you see a circle in the field, it's a, a pretty good indication that you have seed-borne late blight. But I wanna point out one thing that can be similar, that's lightning damage. So this is a field where um, lightning struck. And so you look at that and you'd say, well, this looks like it could be late blight um, from seed. You have these flattened plants, but when you look up close, you really don't, you won't see those lesions that we've talked about. Instead, you see uh, crinkled leaves. They, they, they might, some might be dead, some may not, um, but it's usually circular and it can look a lot like late blight. And one difference is they don't expand over time. But again, imagine you want to wait to see, to watch, see if it can expand or not. You want to know for sure. So you want to go and look and see, do I have those lesions or not? You can cut open stems. And I thank the University of Florida and one of their publications for showing this. If you have this ladder-like appearance on the inside, that's a good indication that what you're looking at is lightning damage. Now, we spent a lot of time on late blight, um, primarily because it is one of the more important diseases. But we also want to talk about these other diseases that can develop from the mid-season to when we want to kill the vines. And so we have early blight, brown spot, uh, botrytis, gray mold, verticillium black dot and white mold. And we'll talk about each of these just briefly. Early blight is caused by the fungus Alternaria solani. The fungus just overwinters in crop debris or even on the soil, and it will first develop on your lower leaves. And you get these, these irregular shaped lesions. And you, see, you know, some of them may be somewhat round, um, but others may be somewhat oblong. And a lot of times when they hit that main vein, they may stop, or you'll see that um, it does affect the development of the lesion but they have these concentric rings, almost like the bullseye target. And when you have plants that are stressed, they're more prone to develop early blight. Here's another picture showing that target type spot. 
Again, you can see they're not always necessarily around, but irregular in shape. And you'll get infection on heavily stressed plants. So when you have um, leaves that start to yellow, whether it be because the nitrogen level in the plant is starting to, to, to drop later in the season, sometimes early blight can come on and cause severe problems. And that senescence will increase susceptibility. Now, um, it's rare, at least in my experience, to see a leaf, uh, like say a leaf that has 50% of the area affected by late blight. Usually what happens when you get to stages like you see here, it is eventually those leaves will actually die. And you can see that here on the, on the, on the lower part, the alternate area um, releases a toxin that causes a, a plant death. It's, it's more than just the loss of the photosynthesis that you see here on the leaf area. And so um, as infection gets more, these leaves die and they drop off. You can also get stem lesions. And here's one right here, which I'm highlighting with the little pointer. Um, they are elongated and brown. And they will develop, develop an infection is severe, but they, they don't quite look like late blight lesions. You know, they're not in, encircling the entire uh, stem. They don't make the stem very brittle. When you're scouting, you need to start fairly early in the season, uh, right around the time of row closure. And again, it can, it, this can develop anywhere in the field. Um, it's not necessarily driven by weather like some of the other diseases, but anywhere you might see your plants under stress, like if you have a low spot or you know you have an area of the soil such where you expect a nutrient deficiency, and you look for these. They're going to be in the lower leaves first. Um, so you look at the very, very bottom of the, of the seed of the plant and they'll move their way up later. Now, somewhat related to early blight is brown leaf spot. And it's caused by alternate alternata and other what we call small spore, spored, sorry, small spore alternarium. And this fungus also survives by spores that can be in the soil and they can blow around during the season. And you'll get these small lesions that have, they may have concentric rings, but they may not. And so you know, these look a little bit different than what we saw with the Alternaria solani. When you have a lot of them, they'll start to coalesce together. So we get these large necrotic areas. And this, you usually see a higher instance of these when you have a warmer, higher temperature. So in this case, we're not seeing those larger lesions like we showed in the earlier pictures with solani. So alternata, you have smaller lesions. If you could go and look again, you can't see this with the naked eye, but if you could look under a microscope, here we have an early blight lesion. And these spores are they're actually quite big um, relative on a relative scale. And they look like a big club or a baseball bat. And they don't actually blow that far in the wind. Um, work that was done by Amanda Gillins at Wisconsin and her students showed that they, they actually, you know, it's not like late blight where they're getting up in these sinister and going these long distances. Um, the brown spot, on the other hand, the smaller lesion, if you look, they look like these almost round, um, not quite circular in nature, maybe a little more club shaped, but they're formed together on this little chain, on these chains. And they're much smaller than these over here. One thing that looks very similar to brown spot is ozone damage, or some of them they call it spots. They'll mainly develop on the underside of the leaves, and you may not, they may not go all the way through, so you may not see the symptoms on the upper side. They won't have concentric rings. Um, it is favored by hot humid weather like you might see with brown spot. But if you look at, take them to a diagnostic lab or, a, or, or are able to look at them in the microscope, you won't see the spores or you typically won't. Moving on to Botrytis gray mold. Um, this is a fungus that persists in the soil and dead decaying plant material. It's favored by cool, wet weather. Um, now the gray mold pathogen is not really a strong pathogen. It needs a wound to penetrate. And you'll usually see it start on leaf margins. And one very characteristic symptom is the fuzzy gray brown fungal growth. In some cases, you will get these concentric rings like we see with early blight, but they'll be farther apart. And over here, you have the concentric rings, but we also have this gray growth. And if there's a lot of it and you pull the canopy open, you'll see this, this puff of the spores come up. Here's an example of the infection starting at the leaf margin where water may be pooling. A little more severe case where it started at the, the very tip of the, the leaflet and it's moving its way up and that's because you have water accumulation there and here's that dense fuzzy gray growth this is the actual fungus itself producing spores and so it's wet and humid you'll see this now it can be confused about early and late blight sometimes the symptoms will look similar in fact this picture over here is a sample that's submitted where the the, the scout thought they had late blight um, but further investigation showed this was gray mold. Um, you may get concentric rings, but it'll be spaced farther apart, as we said. And they'll usually be found in the margins first. And you can look for that gray mycelium. 
If you're not sure, one way, one easy thing that anyone can do is put these samples in a plastic bag with non-chlorinated water. And if you keep them there in cool temperatures for about 24 hours, you can look and see what type of, of mycelium do I have. You know, if it's a pure white, you'd be worried you think I've got late blight. If it's more of a gray, then it's most likely gray mold of botrytis. White mold is caused by this fungus sclerotinia sclerotiorum. It persists in the soil of sclerotia. Uh, when you have high humidity and dense canopies, this, uh, that favors the development of disease. And it's favored when you follow crops that are, susceptible, that are more susceptible to like canola and soybeans. And I know the white mold pathogen can infect a, high, a large number of crops. So you always want to open the canopy and look in the lower part, the plants, uh, where, uh, sorry, the lower part of the plants. That's where the disease will start first. Now it survives as these sclerosis, small black, they almost look like mouse droppings. And then they'll produce these little mushrooms, which are um, apothecia. And then they can release the spores into the air. Now the spores themselves really, they can't infect healthy growing tissue. But um, the bud, flower buds are really good at catching those spores, just like they catch pollen. And then when they fall down in the lower canopy, they can cause this disease. And so once you have like a dead material, like a, a dead flower bud, or even dead leaves that have fallen off, like you see down here, that uh, those spores grow in the mycelium. And then that white mycelium, the fuzzy fungal growth, can grow into the healthy stem. And when it gets severe, it can girdle the plant. It, it can also cause a leaf curling like we showed with rhizoctonia and even with blackleg. But when you look down below, you'll see the differences. And these are dried up lesions that have actually totally girdled the stem. And they'll often cause that leaf crinkling we talked about above. And, and one way you can tell that this is what it is, you crack it open and you'll see those sclerotia inside. That's very characteristic of the disease. There's nothing else that does that. But these sclerosis, they fall to the soil. They can persist there for many years. And so when you come back with a, another susceptible crop, then you're likely to, to have white mold again. Now, white mold, it, you look at that white fuzz and you think, well, that's similar to what we talked about with late blight. And it really isn't. Late blight actually doesn't sporulate well on dead tissue, whereas white mold will, you'll see this white mold, it does very well on dead leaves. And that's one difference between the two. You may look down in the canopy and you may see these little uh, mushroom shaped structures. In fact, here I've got a bud, a flower bud that's fallen off and, and there's white mold that's starting to grow on that. You say, wow, here's some more, what, you know, what is this thing here? This is actually the bird's nest fun fungus. It's not related to white mold at all. It grow, it's a, an organism that grows on decaying organic matter. This is actually a good sign. It means you've got decaying organic matter in your soil and uh, it's nothing to worry about. Move on talking about aerial stem rot. Pecto, caused by Pectobacterium keratovorum. This is a close relative of the Pectobacterium that caused this black leg. The difference here is this is a totally above ground um, disease. It spreads from soil to plants by rain splashing um, this is the, from the bacteria in the soil and it needs a wound to penetrate. So usually we see this at, at where there's been say sprayer damage traveling through the field and really most often after you have a hail storm. So when you have a dense canopy with high temperatures and that really does favor the development of this disease. And this was really common in areas last year of North America where we had really, really high temperatures and growers were you know, trying to try to combat those high temperatures. They were irrigating maybe at higher levels than they were it had been normally. So you have warm temperatures, a lot of water, it favors the development of this aerial stem rot. It does not start from the seed. You'll see it above ground. So in this case, you know, this lesion is nowhere at all linked to the seed. There is some kind of wound there and that could have happened from me blowing in the wind. Uh, but it can look similar to what you see. The difference is it is completely above ground. So it starts from a wound. You, and you, white mold can be somewhat slimy at times, but if it's white mold, you're likely to see those um, sclerotia. And it's not late blight. And the late blight is on the stem is not going to be slimy and wet like this. And um, also the aerial stem rot does not produce um, the white growth. Black dot is another important foliar disease covered by Colletatra picoides. It uh, is present in the seed, the soil. It's also airborne. Um, it can survive in the soil and seed tubers, and it will infect almost any part of the plant. It can in infect a number of different hosts, and it's often associated when you get sandy soils. And one reason for that is the sand, as it blows in the wind, it, it wounds and, and makes these, these micro wounds in the plant, and that allows the Colletatra to get in. It's also favored by high temperatures. And we have found that infection starts really early in the season but you don't see them till later on. And so you, you get this latent period where the, the fungus is in the plant, but you really can't see it. Here's an example on the stem, on the tubers over here. And then these are actually the lots, small black sclerotia which form on the stem. And that's a close-up view of what you're seeing up here. 
The lesions can look somewhat like you'd see with brown spot. Um, they don't have concentric rings. Um, they actually, I think they're very, very hard to properly identify. And so you'd have to do, um, you're taking them to a diagnostic lab sometimes to be sure. They can affect the stems uh, below ground and you get this, uh, it basically will cause the outer cortex of the stem just to slough off. Above ground, it'll have this white appearance with these black dots that start to form on it. And this is usually caused by abrasions that happen that allow the pathogen to get in. Below ground, you get these infections that can look somewhat like rhizoc, but are a little bit different. So I have rhizoc here on the left side, the left circle. And on the right, this is a black dot lesion. And so they can be confused with rhizoctonia, but I'll spend more time on that because we're going to focus on the foliar diseases. And this is an example of a stem that's died. And all those little black dots you see is, is the pathogen. It does cause that stem to have a pink discoloration or an amethyst color. And that's another key characteristic of the disease. Now it will cause plants to wilt. It tends to start at the top of the plant and work its way down, unlike verticillium wilt, which will start at the bottom and work its way up. And so with that, we'll talk about verticillium wilt for just a moment. It's caused by verticillium dallii. And there's also a verticillium albo atrium, which can cause this, but it's seed borne, but the, the seed uh, at, portion is probably not that important. It's really a soil borne fungus. It penetrates through the roots and it's favored by uh, periods of stress, especially heat and drought. And the fungus basically grows up through the xylem of the vascular tissue and plugs it. So the water from the soil can't get up the plant where it needs to go. And thus you see this wilting that, that, that can occur. And it can occur fairly early in the season. And it'll cause early death of the plants and it'll take away a lot of yield. So you get these, these leaf yellowing, um, the lower portion of plants are moving upwards. Sometimes you'll see this unit, what we call unilateral uh, death or wilting, where one side of the petiole, you have a more advanced symptoms than what you see on the other side, where the leaves are green and healthier. And that can also be true in the plant. You may have one leaf on one side that's showing it and one on the other that doesn't. If you cut open the tubers, you'll see a discoloration inside the vascular tissue. Uh, what's more telling is the discoloration that occurs in the stem. So if you cut close to the ground level with a slanting cut, you, and you see this, this discoloration, you know that the fungus is growing up in here and it's plugged those water conducting elements. And that results in this flagging symptom. So infected plants, the stem tends to stand straight up. Eventually the leaves will die and fall off. This is another photo showing the flagging in the field and what you might see if that were verticillium wilt. We start looking for verticillium wilt before row closure. Um, typically it may be later in the season than that, but this happens from um, having the, it's usually spotty, You'll see, you may see it in heavily fed the soils earlier. So look for these anytime during the day, but they tend to be more easy to see in the afternoon. Usually they re recover somewhat during the night when it's cool. And um, <clears throat> as it gets hot, the plant starts to wilt because it can't get the water that it needs. Now there's a disease we call early dying and it's an interaction between the verticillium root lesion nematode. And a lot of times we use early dying synonymously with verticillium wilt, but they are really different uh, or they, I should say the combination of the vert with the root lesion nematode can, is, is much more severe than the wilting you get with verticillium alone. Um, symptoms are more severe. You get wilted studded plants and usually the nematodes are somewhat aggregated in the field so you have these spots rather than have it spread out. You need to take a soil sample to the lab and they can give you an idea and tell you if that's it. Now there's another disease that looks similar and that is fusarium wilt. And it's caused by multiple fusaria species. It is a seed and a soil born um, fungus. It causes just a general wilt, which looks a little bit different than the things that we've seen before. Um, you do get leaf death uh, lower on on the plant, but you just get a general wilting throughout the entire plant. So whereas colitox or black dot or verticillium, you may see it progress by stages. When fusarium comes on it, it tends to show in the entire plant all at once. We'll close off our presentation talking about just a couple of viruses. You know, there are many common foliar potato viruses. Um, we have the letter, the alphabet viruses, the Y, A, M, S, and X. The potato virus Y is by far the most important mosaic virus. There's also alfalfa mosaic virus, but it's not very common in leaf roll virus. Um, we'll talk about PBY. It is the most common one worldwide. Um, it persists um, in infected seed tubers. That's the way it's really moved around or volunteer potato plants. And it can be in some weeds but it's vectored from plant to plant during the growing season by the green peach aphid in a non-persistent manner. And think of the way to do this, basically as the aphid feeds on the plant, an infected plant, its mouth part or the stylet, it picks up 
of the virus. So it's like it has a dirty mouth. And then as it flies to the next potato and feeds, it kind of cleans off its mouth. And so that plant becomes infected. And so it can't sustain the, the transmission of this plant for a long period of time. And you can't have mechanical transmission of PDY in the field. And as the incidence gets high, um, here in the save of 8%, you can start to see significant yield reductions. And it can cause tuber necrosis in some cases. The common mosaic virus we have, PDY strain O, uh, might, might form a number of different symptoms where you have leaf death, the leaves will appear crinkled, they may be mottled, and you get necrosis. But this has really changed. Uh, this shows the composition of strains at Othello, Washington, um, over from 2000 to 2015 with uh, the strain O, what we call the recombinant strain, and then the tuber necrotic strain. And what's happened is the PDYO has really decreased, and we've had these recombinant strains, what we call NOR and Wilga, have increased. If we look at a report that's coming out of New Brunswick, Canada, there's a similar occurrence where you have a decrease in O, and not so much on the recombinant strain, but this the tuber necrotic strain. And these different strains cause different symptoms out in the, in the plants. This is a picture of Ranger Russet with the PVYO versus the uh, recombinant NO and NTN. Now, not all strains are going to be the same. Um, some infections may not cause foliar symptoms, but if you're interested, I would encourage you to contact Jonathan Whitworth. Um, this is his email, jonathan.whitworth at usda.gov. And he has a, a poster that shows the different virus strains, how they interact with a number of different varieties, and he's willing to give that to you for free. Um, he's asked that people contact him for that so that he can keep track of how many times he has, he has given this out. But if you want to learn more, that's a good place to go. And the last one we'll talk about is um, potato leaf roll virus. So it's really disappeared much in, the, in recent years, but it's something that can show up. The symptoms will be somewhat similar to what we saw with rhizoctonia or maybe even with um, black leg where you get um, the, low, the, the lower leaves may be rolled up if it's a seed borne infection. If you have a current season infection from aphid transmission, the leaves in the top will be rolled up. If you're on the red skin variety, you may have this deep red color that's associated with that. But we don't see this very often. Again, you'd have to have this tested at the lab to be sure. So in summary, we'll show us just some examples of these as we compare wilting. You've got a black dot wilt over here compared to say black leg or dakia. And here's fusarium wilt versus verticillium wilt. And, and you are gonna have some uh, degrees of, of where they of overlap on the symptoms of those. But there are some looking at these that may help you distinguish between those. When it comes to things where you have white growth above ground, you know, we talked about rhizoctonia with that mat like growth, um, late blight with its sparse sporulation on stems, and then that white cottony growth, which we see with white mold. So that's the presentation I have for you today. As mentioned, we do have uh, a CCA credit, and so you can scan that to get uh, credit for that. But at this point, I'd be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Wonderful. Okay, well, thank you so much, Jeff. I'm just opening up the questions here. Um, just a reminder that questions in the Q&A tab uh, will be read out verbally to Jeff. So if you feel free to um, type your questions in there. Our first question is here, Jeff. Um, and thanking you for the presentation, first of all, which I echo. Um, the question is, do you find that using field testing kits for foliage and virus diseases helpful on early detection? What are, um, are there some recommended options um, or places to browse these field, question, field testing um, products? Any recommendations you could make there? Yes, that's actually one of the, one, a great tool are some of these rapid diagnostic kits. There are um, probably, you know, there's a number of different uh, ones that are available. In fact, the University of Idaho put out a publication where they looked at the use of multiple test kits. Um, I don't have that readily at hand, but they, they didn't find really a difference in performance. They, all these test kits seem to work really well. There were some from Agdea, uh, some from Pocket Diagnostics, um, and I know I'm forgetting some, but, you know, we, we would test these with viruses, and they did a pretty good job. When it comes to PDY, they can't really tell you what strain you have. They just tell you whether you have PDY or not. Um, they are very helpful for you to know, well, am I looking in the right direction or thinking the right way on my diagnosis? And so I think they are good to use. And um, like I said, I, I apologize, don't have that reference that's readily available, but that's changed. Like I said, you, you search, I know pocket diagnostics and AGD are two that, um, that are used very commonly. Okay, great. Um, so here's an interesting question. Which disease do you think is the most often overlooked 
or perhaps the most incorrectly diagnosed? Oh, that's a tough question. Um, probably, I, 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 I'm going to answer it backwards first. I think late bites probably the least one because we, generally speaking, growers have, have had so much experience with it and we're so worried about it. I think it could be um, maybe early blight brown spot. Um, I, you know, I, I, maybe I'd go to brown spot might be the one that gets misdiagnosed the most. It may be called something else um, because we, there's a lot of things that can, can cause leaf spots on the, on the potato leaves, including um, fertility issues. Mm -hmm. And so we go out there and I guess I've said this incorrectly, but I, I've heard a lot of times people will say, well, I must have brown spot. You know, when they see these spots in the leaf and they say, I know it's not early blight, so it must be this, this brown spot. Mm -hmm. And whether or not that's the case, um, a lot of times it's it's uh, it's uh, attributed to that. And I don't want to be I don't want to offend anyone here, but sometimes it may be done with the idea that I can hopefully sell you a, a fungicide or something to use on your crop that's going to solve this problem. Right. Um, when indeed it may not be um, brown spot. Another another issue about brown spot. I showed you the pictures of those spores. You know the, the different canidia shapes. So you know early blight has that big. Um, when it looks almost like a baseball bat and brown spot has those small club-like structures. You can actually isolate those small sport alternaria off of leaves that have no lesions whatsoever. Okay. And those fungi have been known to be saprophytes. They can grow on the leaf without causing disease. Um, so I would think that's, the, that's maybe one of the trickiest ones to identify properly. Great answer. Okay, there's a couple more questions here that we can get to. Um, so generally speaking, and I'm sure this varies by disease, but is there a, a time guideline that would um, that you could kind of recognize between the infection by a pathogen and the appearance of a symptom? Oh yeah, that is, that is a great question. It, there's what we call a latent period. So if infection usually occurs, you, there's gonna be a lag in time before you see the symptom. And this is one reason why scouting, um, you need to stay on top of it. Um, you know, it's common for someone to go out and, and let, let, let's, I'll use, let me use white mold as an example. If I wait until I start to see lesions start to form, say on the lower, lower plant parts, and decide I'm going to go spray then, um, we have research that shows you're almost going to waste your time. Okay. Um, you need to spray when you have that first debris on the ground because um, you'll see the lesion, you'll go out and spray. And you come back a few days later and that lesion's gotten bigger. And then the, right. the, the thought is, well, what, what, what happened? I, I used this application to not work. And it, as well, actually, no, what happened is that infection was already there. You just couldn't see it. And um, those, yeah, it varies from disease. Disease with late blight is probably a couple of days. Early blight, it could be even a week or longer. Um, but you, you do have that, that latent period. And so I would say this, I, I'm not negating scouting, but if there are certain, certain diseases that you know you're going to have, you need to treat them preventatively before they even show up. Um, because if you wait for them to, to appear, you're, you're just, you're starting late and it's too hard to catch up. Okay, that's uh, kind of leads into a, another question that I've got here on the docket for you, but there's a couple more coming in uh, from our audience. So I'll go to there first. Um, are there, can you, can you recommend any software or um, maybe apps that you could use to identify potato diseases using symptoms of, uh, you know, the photos of um, symptoms in the field that maybe you would have taken while you're out scouting or, or just, you know, that you come across some of those photos that you um, shared today in the presentation, for example. Well, I'm not aware of any app that would do that for you. Um, you know, where you, I, I know they have those apps where you like take a picture of like a flower and it will tell you what they think it mm -hmm. is. I'm not aware of any to do that for diseases. I, I think there are some under development. I know there are some um, drone companies that can take digital images of the field and then they can use um, from that, they'll, they'll uh, predict what might be a uh, late blight or some insect pests. I know uh, AgroScout um, out of Israel has done some of that work and um, have had some success with that. Okay. Um, and, and so some of those programs can be used to help you, but I think you, you, you use those as an aid. Once you have that, um, that image, say, you'd want to go out in the field and look and say, is this really what I'm seeing? Because a lot of times those programs, you know, the things that they might detect as being a lesion so might be a leaf shadow, or it might be a tear in the leaf or, or, or something else. 
Yes, great reminder. Um, now, I'm just going to go back to scouting a little bit here um, because you were talking about, uh, you know, using scouting as the decision on when to spray. Um, you know, when it comes to starting your fungicide applications, what what factors go into deciding timing on those? Should scouting be that primary method to decide it, or uh, are there other guidelines that you can suggest? Well, I think um, you know, with with many of the foliar diseases, um, and, and I, I have to admit, I'm coming from a, a, a semi-arid bias here in mm -hmm. the Pacific Northwest, the U.S. When we talk about early blight, brown spot and white mold um, and, and even a black dot to some degree, we found that you really need to be preventative with your fungicide applications. And because those diseases, growers, they, they, they tend to see just about every year, mm -hmm. um, we recommend that they apply, say, starting either right around row closure, right around that time, you know, before you're seeing any symptoms, and to use a more premium uh, fungicide early. And we found that as we use those later in the season, it just you don't get as much uh, cost effectiveness out of it. Okay. And so, um, and I, because they're our sponsor, I'll, I'll pick on Syngenta with Meredith Pine. That's a good example. And we found that if we use that, say, right around um, row closure, maybe shortly after that, we get good control of, of early blight, brown spot, and white mold. Um, if I wait until it shows up, it doesn't work quite as well. And so, with those diseases, I feel that you really need to be preventative. Now, late blight's a little bit different for us. Um, especially because we're under dry conditions, we actually pretty much wait until we hear about late blight in the area or see it. And at that point, you know, we spread the word, we get, we get the word out there, we ring the alarm bell, and then we ramp up the program, the fungicide programs. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think that's just about all the time we have for questions for today. So Jeff, thank you very much for this informative presentation. Um, so many great visuals and, and uh, tons of information to uh, digest here. So for our audience, just a reminder that you will be receiving a follow-up email from us within about 24 hours um, with a recording of today's webinar. So uh, be on the lookout for that. That should come through to your email. Um, just a reminder again, if you're not able to scan the QR code that's up on your screen there, uh, please send me an email. The instructions are also posted in the chat. Um, I see a couple of emails coming in, so I'll be happy to get those uh, CCA credits processed for you. And if you have any further questions for Jeff that we didn't get to today, you can reach him via email or send the email to us and we'll put you in touch with him. Many thanks again to today's webinar sponsor, Syngenta, and our webinar collaborator, the Ontario Potato Board, for their organization and, uh, and help in conducting this webinar. Many thanks to you, Jeff Miller, for your fantastic presentation today. Don't forget to visit potatoesincanada.com slash webinars for more information about our past and future webinars hosted by Potatoes in Canada. Thanks everyone for joining us today. Best of luck as you get your season started and we'll talk to you soon. Bye.